Samuel Langhorn Clemens, known by his pen name Mark Twain, was an American writer, humorist entrepreneur, publisher, and lecturer. He was lauded as the greatest humorist as produced, and William Faulkner called him the father of American literature. His novels include The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and its sequel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, the latter often called the great American novel. Twain was raised in Hannibal, Missouri, which later provided the setting for Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. He served an apprenticeship with a printer and then worked as a typesetter, contributing articles to the newspaper of his older brother Orion Clemens. He later became a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River before heading west to join Orion in Nevada. He referred humorously to his lack of success at mining, turning to journalism for the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise. His humorous story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, was published in 1865, based on a story that he heard at Angel's Hotel in Angel's Camp, California, where he had spent some time as a miner. The short story brought international attention, and was even translated into French. His wit and satire, in prose and in speech, earned praise from critics and peers, and he was a friend to presidents, artists, industrialists, and European royalty. Twain earned a great deal of money from his writings and lectures, but he invested in ventures that lost most of it, such as the page compositor, a mechanical typesetter that failed because of its complexity and imprecision. He filed for bankruptcy in the wake of these financial setbacks, but in time overcame his financial troubles with the help of Henry Huttleston Rogers. He eventually paid all his creditors in full, even though his bankruptcy relieved him of having to do so. Twain was born shortly after an appearance of Halley's Comet, and he predicted that he would go out with it as well, he died the day after the comet made its closest approach to the Earth. Chapter 1, Biography Chapter 2 Section 1, Early Life Samuel Langhorne Clemens was born on November 30, 1835, in Florida, Missouri. He was the sixth of seven children of Jane, a native of Kentucky, and John Marshall Clemens, a native of Virginia. His parents met when his father moved to Missouri. They were married in 1823. Twain was of Cornish, English, and Scots-Irish descent. Only three of his siblings survived childhood, Orion, Henry, and Pamela. His brother Pleasant Hannibal died at three weeks of age, his sister Margaret when Twain was three, and his brother Benjamin three years later. When he was four, Twain's family moved to Hannibal, Missouri, a port town on the Mississippi River that inspired the fictional town of St. Petersburg in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Slavery was legal in Missouri at the time, and it became a theme in these writings. His father was an attorney and judge, who died of pneumonia in 1847, when Twain was eleven. The following year, Twain left school after the fifth grade to become a printer's apprentice. In 1851, he began working as a typesetter, contributing articles and humorous sketches to the Hannibal Journal, a newspaper that Orion owned. When he was 18, he left Hannibal and worked as a printer in New York City, Philadelphia, St. Louis, and Cincinnati, joining the newly formed International Typographical Union, the Printer's Trade Union. He educated himself in public libraries in the evenings, finding wider information than at a conventional school. Twain describes his boyhood in life on the Mississippi, stating that there was but one permanent ambition among his comrades, to be a steamboatman. Pilot was the grandest position of all. The pilot, even in those days of trivial wages, had a princely salary, from $150 to $250 a month, and no board to pay. As Twain described it, the pilot's prestige exceeded that of the captain. The pilot had to get up a warm personal acquaintanceship with every old snag and one-limbed cottonwood and every obscure wood pile that ornaments the banks of this river for 1200 miles, and more than that, must actually know where these things are in the dark. Steamboat pilot Horace E. Bixby took Twain on as a cub pilot to teach him the river between New Orleans and St. Louis for $500, and in 
payable out of Twain's first wages after graduating. Twain studied the Mississippi, learning its landmarks, how to navigate its currents effectively, and how to read the river and its constantly shifting channels, reefs, submerged snags, and rocks that would tear the life out of the strongest vessel that ever floated. It was more than two years before he received his pilot's license. Piloting also gave him his pen name from Mark Twain, the leadsman's cry for a measured river depth of two fathoms, which was safe water for a steamboat. Dot. As a young pilot, Clemens served on the steamer A.B. Chambers with Grant Marsh, who became famous for his exploits as a steamboat captain on the Missouri River. The two liked each other, and admired one another, and maintained a correspondence for many years after Clemens left the river. While training, Samuel convinced his younger brother Henry to work with him, and even arranged a post of mud clerk for him on the steamboat Pennsylvania. On June 13, 1858, the steamboat's boiler exploded, Henry succumbed to his wounds on June 21. Twain claimed to have foreseen this death in a dream a month earlier, which inspired his interest in parapsychology, he was an early member of the Society for Psychical Research. Twain was guilt-stricken, and held himself responsible for the rest of his life. He continued to work on the river and was a river pilot until the Civil War broke out in 1861, when traffic was curtailed along the Mississippi River. At the start of hostilities, he enlisted briefly in a local Confederate unit. He later wrote the sketch The Private History of a Campaign That Failed, describing how he and his friends had been Confederate volunteers for two weeks before disbanding. He then left for Nevada to work for his brother Orion, who was Secretary of the Nevada Territory. Twain describes the episode in his book Roughing It. Chapter 2 Section 2, In the American West Orion became Secretary to Nevada Territory Governor James W. Nye in 1861, and Twain joined him when he moved west. The brothers traveled more than two weeks on a stagecoach across the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, visiting the Mormon community in Salt Lake City. Twain's journey ended in the silver mining town of Virginia City, Nevada, where he became a miner on the Comstock Lode. He failed as a miner and went to work at the Virginia City newspaper Territorial Enterprise, working under a friend, the writer Dan DeKia. He first used his pen name here on February 3, 1863, when he wrote a humorous travel account entitled Letter from Carson, Re, Joe Goodman, Party at Governor Johnson's, Music and signed it Mark Twain. His experiences in the American West inspired Roughing It, written during 1870-71 and published in 1872. His experiences in Angel's Camp provided material for the celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. Twain moved to San Francisco in 1864, still as a journalist, and met writers such as Bret Hart and Artemis Ward. He may have been romantically involved with the poet Ina Coolbrith. His first success as a writer came when his humorous tall tale The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County was published on November 18, 1865, in the New York Weekly The Saturday Press, bringing him national attention. A year later, he traveled to the Sandwich Islands as a reporter for the Sacramento Union. His letters to the Union were popular and became the basis for his first lectures. In 1867, a local newspaper funded his trip to the Mediterranean aboard the Quaker City, including a tour of Europe and the Middle East. He wrote a collection of travel letters which were later compiled as The Innocents Abroad. It was on this trip that he met fellow passenger Charles Langdon, who showed him a picture of his sister Olivia. Twain later claimed to have fallen in love at first sight. Upon returning to the United States, Twain was offered honorary membership in Yale University's Secret Society Scroll and Key in 1868. Chapter 2 Section 3 Marriage and Children Twain and Olivia Langdon corresponded throughout 1868. After she rejected his first marriage proposal, they were married in Elmira, New York in February 1870, where he courted her and managed to overcome her father's initial reluctance. She came from a wealthy but liberal family, through her, he met abolitionists, socialists, principled atheists and activists for women's rights and social equality, including Harriet Beecher Stowe, 
Frederick Douglass, and writer and utopian socialist William Dean Howells, who became a longtime friend. The couple lived in Buffalo, New York, from 1869 to 1871. He owned a stake in the Buffalo Express newspaper and worked as an editor and writer. While they were living in Buffalo, their son Langdon died of diphtheria at the age of 19 months. They had three daughters, Susie, Clara, and Jean. Twain moved his family to Hartford, Connecticut, where he arranged the building of a home starting in 1873. In the 1870s and 1880s, the family summered at Quarry Farm in Elmira, the home of Olivia's sister, Susan Crane. In 1874, Susan had a study built apart from the main house, so that Twain would have a quiet place in which to write. Also, he smoked cigars constantly, and Susan did not want him to do so in her house. Twain wrote many of his classic novels during his 17 years in Hartford and over 20 summers at Quarry Farm. They include The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, The Prince and the Pauper, Life on the Mississippi, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. The couple's marriage lasted 34 years until Olivia's death in 1904. All of the Clemens family are buried in Elmira's Woodlawn Cemetery. Chapter 2 Section 4, Love of Science and Technology Twain was fascinated with science and scientific inquiry. He developed a close and lasting friendship with Nikola Tesla, and the two spent much time together in Tesla's laboratory. Twain patented three inventions, including an improvement in adjustable and detachable straps for garments and a history trivia game. Most commercially successful was a self-pasting scrapbook, a dried adhesive on the pages needed only to be moistened before use. Over 25,000 were sold. Twain was an early proponent of fingerprinting as a forensic technique, featuring it in a tall tale in Life on the Mississippi and as a central plot element in the novel Puddinhead Wilson. Twain's novel A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court features a time traveler from the contemporary U.S., using his knowledge of science to introduce modern technology to Arthurian England. This type of historical manipulation became a trope of speculative fiction as alternate histories. In 1909, Thomas Edison visited Twain at Stormfield, his home in Reading, Connecticut and filmed him. Part of the footage was used in The Prince and the Pauper, a two-reel short film. It is the only known existing film footage of Twain. Chapter 2 Section 5, Financial Troubles Twain made a substantial amount of money through his writing, but he lost a great deal through investments. He invested mostly in new inventions and technology, particularly the page typesetting machine. It was a beautifully engineered mechanical marvel that amazed viewers when it worked, but it was prone to breakdowns. Twain spent $300,000 on it between 1880 and 1894, but before it could be perfected it was rendered obsolete by the linotype. He lost the bulk of his book profits, as well as a substantial portion of his wife's inheritance. Twain also lost money through his publishing house, Charles L. Webster and Company, which enjoyed initial success selling the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant but failed soon afterward, losing money on a biography of Pope Leo XIII. Fewer than 200 copies were sold. Twain and his family closed down their expensive Hartford home in response to the dwindling income, and moved to Europe in June 1891. William M. Laffin of the New York Sun and the McClure Newspaper Syndicate offered him the publication of a series of six European letters. Twain, Olivia, and their daughter Susie were all faced with health problems, and they believed that it would be of benefit to visit European baths. The family stayed mainly in France, Germany, and Italy until May 1895, with longer spells at Berlin, Florence, and Paris. During that period, Twain returned four times to New York due to his enduring business troubles. He took a cheap room in September 1893 at $1.50 per day at the Players Club, which he had to keep until March 1894, meanwhile, he became the Belle of New York, in the words of biographer Albert Bigelow Payne. Twain's writings and lectures enabled him to recover financially, combined with the help of his friend, 
Henry Huttleston Rogers. In 1893 he began a friendship with the financier, a principal of Standard Oil, that lasted the remainder of his life. Rogers first made him file for bankruptcy in April 1894, then had him transfer the copyrights on his written works to his wife to prevent creditors from gaining possession of them. Finally, Rogers took absolute charge of Twain's money until all his creditors were paid. Twain accepted an offer from Robert Sparrow Smythe and embarked on a year long, around the world lecture tour in July 1895 to pay off his creditors in full, although he was no longer under any legal obligation to do so. It was a long, arduous journey and he was sick much of the time, mostly from a cold and a carbuncle. The first part of the itinerary took him across Northern America to British Columbia, Canada, until the second half of August. For the second part, he sailed across the Pacific Ocean. His scheduled lecture in Honolulu, Hawaii had to be cancelled due to a cholera epidemic. Twain went on to Fiji, Australia, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, India, Mauritius, and South Africa. His three months in India became the centerpiece of his 712-page book following the equator. In the second half of July 1896, he sailed back to England, completing his circumnavigation of the world begun 14 months before Dot Twain and his family spent four more years in Europe, mainly in England and Austria, with longer spells in London and Vienna. Clara had wished to study the piano under Theodore Leszewski in Vienna. However, Jean's health did not benefit from consulting with specialists in Vienna, the city of doctors. The family moved to London in spring 1899, following a lead by Pultley Bigelow, who had a good experience being treated by Dr. Jonas Henrik Kelgren, a Swedish osteopathic practitioner in Belgravia. They were persuaded to spend the summer at Kelgren's sanatorium by the lake in the Swedish village of Sanna. Coming back in fall, they continued the treatment in London, until Twain was convinced by lengthy inquiries in America that similar osteopathic expertise was available there. In mid 1900, he was the guest of newspaper proprietor Hugh Gilsey and Reed at Dollis Hill House, located on the north side of London. Twain wrote that he had never seen any place that was so satisfactorily situated, with its noble trees and stretch of country, and everything that went to make life delightful and all within a biscuit's throw of the metropolis of the world. He then returned to America in October 1900, having earned enough to pay off his debts. In winter 1900-01, he became his country's most prominent opponent of imperialism, raising the issue in his speeches, interviews, and writings. In January 1901, he began serving as vice president of the Anti-Imperialist League of New York. Chapter 2 Section 6, Speaking Engagements Twain was in great demand as a featured speaker, performing solo humorous talks similar to modern stand-up comedy. He gave paid talks to many men's clubs, including the Authors Club, Beefsteak Club, Vagabonds, White Friars, and Monday Evening Club of Hartford. In the late 1890s, he spoke to the Savage Club in London, and was elected an honorary member. He was told that only three men had been so honoured, including the Prince of Wales, and he replied, well, it must make the Prince feel mighty fine. He visited Melbourne and Sydney in 1895 as part of a world lecture tour. In 1897, he spoke to the Concordia Press Club in Vienna as a special guest, following the diplomat Charlemagne Tower Jr. he delivered the speech Die Schrecken der Deutschen Sprache in German, to the great amusement of the audience. In 1901, he was invited to speak at Princeton University's Cleosophic Literary Society, where he was made an honorary member. Chapter 2 Section 7 Subsection 1, Canadian Visits In 1881, Twain was honored at a banquet in Montreal, Canada where he made reference to securing a copyright. In 1883, he paid a brief visit to Ottawa, and he visited Toronto twice in 1884 and 1885 on a reading tour with George Washington Cable, known as the Twins of Genius Tour. The reason for the Toronto visits was to secure Canadian and British copyrights for his upcoming book Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, to which he had alluded in his Montreal visit. 
The reason for the Ottawa visit had been to secure Canadian and British copyrights for life on the Mississippi. Publishers in Toronto had printed unauthorized editions of his books at the time, before an international copyright agreement was established in 1891. These were sold in the United States as well as in Canada, depriving him of royalties. He estimated that Belford Brothers' edition of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer alone had cost him $10,000. He had unsuccessfully attempted to secure the rights for the Prince and the Pauper in 1881, in conjunction with his Montreal trip. Eventually, he received legal advice to register a copyright in Canada prior to publishing in the United States, which would restrain the Canadian publishers from printing a version when the American edition was published. There was a requirement that a copyright be registered to a Canadian resident, he addressed this by his short visits to the country. Chapter 2 Section 7, Later Life and Death Twain lived in his later years at 14 West 10th Street in Manhattan. He passed through a period of deep depression which began in 1896 when his daughter Susie died of meningitis. Olivia's death in 1904 and Jean's on December 24, 1909, deepened his gloom. On May 20, 1909, his close friend Henry Rogers died suddenly. In April 1906, he heard that his friend Ina Coolbrith had lost nearly all that she owned in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, and he volunteered a few autographed portrait photographs to be sold for her benefit. To further aid Coolbrith, George Wharton James visited Twain in New York and arranged for a new portrait session. He was resistant initially, but he eventually admitted that four of the resulting images were the finest ones ever taken of him. In September, Twain started publishing chapters from his autobiography in the North American Review. The same year, Charlotte Teller, a writer living with her grandmother at 3 Fifth Avenue, began an acquaintanceship with him which lasted several years and may have included romantic intentions on his part. Twain formed a club in 1906 for girls whom he viewed as surrogate granddaughters called the Angel Fish and Aquarium Club. The dozen or so members ranged in age from 10 to 16. He exchanged letters with his angel fish girls and invited them to concerts and the theater and to play games. Twain wrote in 1908 that the club was his life's chief delight. In 1907, he met Dorothy Quick on a transatlantic crossing, beginning a friendship that was to last until the very day of his death. Oxford University awarded Twain an honorary doctorate in letters in 1907. Twain was born two weeks after Halley's Comet's closest approach in 1835, he said in 1909. I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year, and I expect to go out with it. It will be the greatest disappointment of my life if I don't go out with Halley's Comet. The Almighty has said, no doubt, now here are these two unaccountable freaks, they came in together, they must go out together. Twain's prediction was accurate, he died of a heart attack on April 21, 1910, in Stormfield, one day after the comet's closest approach to Earth. Upon hearing of Twain's death, President William Howard Taft said. Mark Twain gave pleasure, real intellectual enjoyment, to millions, and his works will continue to give such pleasure to millions yet to come, his humor was American, but he was nearly as much appreciated by Englishmen, and people of other countries as by his own countrymen. He has made an enduring part of American literature. Twain's funeral was at the Brick Presbyterian Church on Fifth Avenue, New York. He is buried in his wife's family plot at Woodlawn Cemetery in Elmira, New York. The Langdon family plot is marked by a 12-foot monument placed there by his surviving daughter Clara. There is also a smaller headstone. He expressed a preference for cremation, but he acknowledged that his surviving family would have the last word. Officials in Connecticut and New York estimated the value of Twain's estate at $471,000. Chapter 2, Writing Chapter 3 Section 1 Overview. Twain began his career writing light, humorous verse, 
but he became a chronicler of the vanities, hypocrisies, and murderous acts of mankind. At mid-career, he combined rich humor, sturdy narrative, and social criticism in Huckleberry Finn. He was a master of rendering colloquial speech and helped to create and popularize a distinctive American literature built on American themes and language. Many of his works have been suppressed at times for various reasons. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn has been repeatedly restricted in American high schools, not least for its frequent use of the word nigger, which was in common usage in the pre-Civil War period in which the novel was set. A complete bibliography of Twain's works is nearly impossible to compile because of the vast number of pieces he wrote, and his use of several different pen names. Additionally, a large portion of his speeches and lectures have been lost or not recorded, thus, the compilation of Twain's works is an ongoing process. Researchers rediscovered published material as recently as 1995 and 2015. Chapter 3 Section 2 Early Journalism and Travelogues Twain was writing for the Virginia City newspaper The Territorial Enterprise in 1863 when he met lawyer Tom Fitch, editor of the competing newspaper Virginia Daily Union and known as the silver-tongued orator of the Pacific. He credited Fitch with giving him his first really profitable lesson in writing. When I first began to lecture, and in my earlier writings, Twain later commented, my sole idea was to make comic capital out of everything I saw and heard. In 1866, he presented his lecture on the Sandwich Islands to a crowd in Washoe City, Nevada. Afterwards, Fitch told him, Clemens, your lecture was magnificent. It was eloquent, moving, sincere. Never in my entire life have I listened to such a magnificent piece of descriptive narration. But you committed one unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin. It is a sin you must never commit again. You closed a most eloquent description, by which you had keyed your audience up to a pitch of the intensest interest, with a piece of atrocious anticlimax which nullified all the really fine effect you had produced. It was in these days that Twain became a writer of the Sagebrush School, he was known later as its most famous member. His first important work was The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, published in the New York Saturday Press on November 18, 1865. After a burst of popularity, the Sacramento Union commissioned him to write letters about his travel experiences. The first journey that he took for this job, was to ride the steamer Ix on its maiden voyage to the Sandwich Islands. All the while, he was writing letters to the newspaper that were meant for publishing, chronicling his experiences with humor. These letters proved to be the genesis to his work with the San Francisco Alta California newspaper, which designated him a traveling correspondent for a trip from San Francisco to New York City via the Panama Isthmus. On June 8, 1867, he set sail on the pleasure cruiser Quaker City for five months, and this trip resulted in the Innocents Abroad, or the New Pilgrim's Progress. In 1872, he published his second piece of travel literature, Roughing It, as an account of his journey from Missouri to Nevada, his subsequent life in the American West, and his visit to Hawaii. The book lampoons American and Western society in the same way that Innocents critiqued the various countries of Europe and the Middle East. His next work was The Gilded Age, a tale of today, his first attempt at writing a novel. The book, written with his neighbor Charles Dudley Warner, is also his only collaboration. Twain's next work drew on his experiences on the Mississippi River. Old Times on the Mississippi was a series of sketches published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1875 featuring his disillusionment with Romanticism. Old Times eventually became the starting point for life on the Mississippi. Chapter 3 Section 3, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn Twain's next major publication was The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, which draws on his youth in Hannibal. Tom Sawyer was modeled on Twain as a child, with traces of schoolmates John Briggs and Will Bowen. The book also introduces Huckleberry Finn in a supporting role, based on Twain's boyhood friend Tom Blankenship. The Prince and the Pauper was not as well received, 
despite a storyline that is common in film and literature today. The book tells the story of two boys born on the same day who are physically identical, acting as a social commentary as the prince and pauper switch places. Twain had started Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and had completed his travel book A Tramp Abroad, which describes his travels through Central and Southern Europe. Twain's next major published work was The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which confirmed him as a noteworthy American writer. Some have called it the first great American novel, and the book has become required reading in many schools throughout the United States. Huckleberry Finn was an offshoot from Tom Sawyer and had a more serious tone than its predecessor. 400 manuscript pages were written in mid-1876, right after the publication of Tom Sawyer. The last fifth of Huckleberry Finn is subject to much controversy. Some say that Twain experienced a failure of nerve, as critic Leo Marx puts it. Ernest Hemingway once said of Huckleberry Finn, If you read it, you must stop where the nigger Jim is stolen from the boys. That is the real end. The rest is just cheating. Hemingway also wrote in the same essay. All modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. Near the completion of Huckleberry Finn, Twain wrote Life on the Mississippi, which is said to have heavily influenced the novel. The travel work recounts Twain's memories and new experiences after a 22-year absence from the Mississippi River. In it, he also explains that Mark Twain was the call made when the boat was in safe water, indicating a depth of two fathoms. Chapter 3 Section 4 Later Writing Twain produced President Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs through his fledgling publishing house, Charles L. Webster & Company, which he co-owned with Charles L. Webster, his nephew by marriage. At this time he also wrote the private history of a campaign that failed for the Century magazine. This piece detailed his two-week stint in a Confederate militia during the Civil War. He next focused on a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, written with the same historical fiction style as The Prince and the Pauper. A Connecticut Yankee showed the absurdities of political and social norms by setting them in the court of King Arthur. The book was started in December 1885, then shelved a few months later until the summer of 1887, and eventually finished in the spring of 1889. His next large-scale work was Puddinhead Wilson, which he wrote rapidly, as he was desperately trying to stave off bankruptcy. From November 12 to December 14, 1893, Twain wrote 60,000 words for the novel. Critics have pointed to this rushed completion as the cause of the novel's rough organization and constant disruption of the plot. This novel also contains the tale of two boys born on the same day who switch positions in life, like the prince and the pauper. It was first published serially in Century magazine and, when it was finally published in book form, Puddinhead Wilson appeared as the main title, however, the subtitles make the entire title read, The Tragedy of Puddinhead Wilson and the Comedy of the Extraordinary Twins. Twain's next venture was a work of straight fiction that, that he called Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc and dedicated to his wife. He had long said that this was the work that he was most proud of, despite the criticism that he received for it. The book had been a dream of his since childhood, and he claimed that he had found a manuscript detailing the life of Joan of Arc when he was an adolescent. This was another piece that he was convinced would save his publishing company. His financial advisor Henry Huttleston Rogers quashed that idea and got Twain out of that business altogether, but the book was published nonetheless. To pay the bills and keep his business projects afloat, Twain had begun to write articles and commentary furiously, with diminishing returns, but it was not enough. He filed for bankruptcy in 1894. During this time of dire financial straits, he published several literary reviews in newspapers to help make ends meet. He famously derided James Fenimore Cooper in his article detailing Cooper's literary offenses. He became an extremely outspoken critic of other authors and other critics, he suggested that, before praising Cooper's work, Thomas Lounsbury, Brander Matthews, and Wilkie Collins ought to have read some of it. George Eliot, Jane Austen, 
and Robert Louis Stevenson also fell under Twain's attack during this time period, beginning around 1890 and continuing until his death. He outlines what he considers to be quality writing in several letters and essays, in addition to providing a source for the tooth and claw style of literary criticism. He places emphasis on concision, utility of word choice, and realism, he complains, for example, that Cooper's Deerslayer purports to be realistic but has several shortcomings. Ironically, several of his own works were later criticized for lack of continuity and organization. Twain's wife died in 1904 while the couple was staying at the Villa di Corto in Florence. After some time had passed he published some works that his wife, his de facto editor and censor throughout her married life, had looked down upon. The Mysterious Stranger is perhaps the best known, depicting various visits of Satan to Earth. This particular work was not published in Twain's lifetime. His manuscripts included three versions, written between 1897 and 1905, the so-called Hannibal, Esseldorf, and print shop versions. The resulting confusion led to extensive publication of a jumbled version, and only recently have the original versions become available as Twain wrote them. Twain's last work was his autobiography, which he dictated and thought would be most entertaining if he went off on whims and tangents in non-chronological order. Some archivists and compilers have rearranged the biography into a more conventional form, thereby eliminating some of Twain's humor and the flow of the book. The first volume of the autobiography, over 736 pages, was published by the University of California in November 2010, 100 years after his death, as Twain wished. It soon became an unexpected bestseller, making Twain one of a very few authors publishing new best-selling volumes in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Chapter 3 Section 5, Censorship Twain's works have been subjected to censorship efforts. According to Stewart, leading these banning campaigns, generally, were religious organizations or individuals in positions of influence, not so much working librarians, who had been instilled with that American library spirit which honored intellectual freedom. In 1905, the Brooklyn Public Library banned both The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer from the Children's Department because of their language. Chapter 3, Views? Twain's views became more radical as he grew older. In a letter to friend and fellow writer William Dean Howells in 1887 he acknowledged that his views had changed and developed over his lifetime, referring to one of his favorite works. When I finished Carlyle's French Revolution in 1871, I was a Girondon, every time I have read it since, I have read it differently, being influenced and changed, little by little, by life and environment, and now I lay the book down once more, and recognize that I am a sansculotte and not a pale, characterless sansculot, but a mara. Chapter 4 Section 1, Anti-Imperialist Before 1899, Twain was an ardent imperialist. In the late 1860s and early 1870s, he spoke out strongly in favor of American interests in the Hawaiian Islands. He said the war with Spain in 1898 was the worthiest war ever fought. In 1899, however, he reversed course. In the New York Herald, October 16, 1900, Twain describes his transformation and political awakening, in the context of the Philippine-American War, to anti-imperialism. I wanted the American Eagle to go screaming into the Pacific, why not spread its wings over the Philippines, I asked myself. I said to myself, here are a people who have suffered for three centuries. We can make them as free as ourselves, give them a government and country of their own, put a miniature of the American Constitution afloat in the Pacific, start a brand new republic to take its place among the free nations of the world. It seemed to me a great task to which we had addressed ourselves. But I have thought some more, since then, and I have read carefully the Treaty of Paris, and I have seen that we do not intend to free, but to subjugate the people of the Philippines. We have gone there to conquer, not to redeem. It should, it seems to me, 
be our pleasure and duty to make those people free, and let them deal with their own domestic questions in their own way. And so I am an anti-imperialist. I am opposed to having the eagle put its talons on any other land. During the Boxer Rebellion, Twain said that the Boxer is a patriot. He loves his country better than he does the countries of other people. I wish him success. From 1901, soon after his return from Europe, until his death in 1910, Twain was vice president of the American Anti Imperialist League, which opposed the annexation of the Philippines by the United States and had tens of thousands of members. He wrote many political pamphlets for the organization. The incident in the Philippines, posthumously published in 1924, was in response to the Moro Crater Massacre, in which 600 Moros were killed. Many of his neglected and previously uncollected writings on anti imperialism appeared for the first time in book form in 1992. Twain was critical of imperialism in other countries as well. In Following the Equator, Twain expresses hatred and condemnation of imperialism of all stripes. He was highly critical of European imperialists, such as Cecil Rhodes, who greatly expanded the British Empire, and Leopold II, King of the Belgians. King Leopold's soliloquy is a stinging political satire about his private colony, the Congo Free State. Reports of outrageous exploitation and grotesque abuses led to widespread international protest in the early 1900s, arguably the first large-scale human rights movement. In the soliloquy, the king argues that bringing Christianity to the country outweighs a little starvation. Leopold's rubber gatherers were tortured, maimed and slaughtered until the movement forced Brussels to call a halt. During the Philippine-American War, Twain wrote a short pacifist story titled The War Prayer, which makes the point that humanism and Christianity's preaching of love are incompatible with the conduct of war. It was submitted to Harper's Bazaar for publication, but on March 22, 1905, the magazine rejected the story as not quite suited to a woman's magazine. Eight days later, Twain wrote to his friend Daniel Carter Beard, to whom he had read the story, I don't think the prayer will be published in my time. None but the dead are permitted to tell the truth. Because he had an exclusive contract with Harper and Brothers, Twain could not publish the war prayer elsewhere, it remained unpublished until 1923. It was republished as campaigning material by Vietnam War protesters. Twain acknowledged that he had originally sympathized with the more moderate Girondins of the French Revolution and then shifted his sympathies to the more radical Sansculottes, indeed identifying himself as a Marat and writing that the reign of terror paled in comparison to the older terrors that preceded it. Twain supported the revolutionaries in Russia against the reformists, arguing that the Tsar must be got rid of by violent means, because peaceful ones would not work. He summed up his views of revolutions in the following statement. I am said to be a revolutionist in my sympathies, by birth, by breeding and by principle. I am always on the side of the revolutionists, because there never was a revolution unless there were some oppressive and intolerable conditions against which to revolute. Chapter 4 Section 2 Civil Rights Twain was an adamant supporter of the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of slaves, even going so far as to say, Lincoln's proclamation, not only set the black slaves free, but set the white man free also. He argued that non-whites did not receive justice in the United States, once saying, I have seen Chinamen abused and maltreated in all the mean, cowardly ways possible to the invention of a degraded nature, but I never saw a Chinaman righted in a court of justice for wrongs thus done to him. He paid for at least one black person to attend Yale Law School and for another black person to attend a Southern University to become a minister. Twain's sympathetic views on race were not reflected in his early writings on American Indians. Of them, Twain wrote in 1870, his heart is a cesspool of falsehood, of treachery, and of low and devilish instincts. With him, gratitude is an unknown emotion, and when one does him a kindness, it is safest to keep the face toward him, lest the reward be an arrow in the back. To accept of a favor from him is to assume a debt which you can never repay to his satisfaction, though you bankrupt yourself trying. The Scum of the Earth 
As counterpoint, Twain's essay on the literary offences of Fenimore Cooper offers a much kinder view of Indians. No, other Indians would have noticed these things, but Cooper's Indians never notice anything. Cooper thinks they are marvelous creatures for noticing, but he was almost always in error about his Indians. There was seldom a sane one among them. In his later travelogue following the equator, Twain observes that in colonized lands all over the world, savages have always been wronged by whites in the most merciless ways, such as robbery, humiliation, and slow, slow murder, through poverty and the white man's whiskey, his conclusion is that there are many humorous things in this world, among them the white man's notion that he is less savage than the other savages. In an expression that captures his East Indian experiences, he wrote, so far as I am able to judge nothing has been left undone, either by man or nature, to make India the most extraordinary country that the sun visits on his rounds. Where every prospect pleases, and only man is vile. Twain was also a staunch supporter of women's rights and an active campaigner for women's suffrage. His Votes for Women speech, in which he pressed for the granting of voting rights to women, is considered one of the most famous in history. Helen Keller benefited from Twain's support as she pursued her college education and publishing despite her disabilities and financial limitations. The two were friends for roughly 16 years. Through Twain's efforts, the Connecticut legislature voted a pension for Prudence Crandall, since 1995 Connecticut's official heroine, for her efforts towards the education of African American young ladies in Connecticut. Twain also offered to purchase for her use her former house in Canterbury, home of the Canterbury Female Boarding School, but she declined. Chapter 4 Section 3, Labor Twain wrote glowingly about unions in the river boating industry in Life on the Mississippi, which was read in union halls decades later. He supported the labor movement, especially one of the most important unions, the Knights of Labor. In a speech to them, he said, who are the oppressors? The few, the king, the capitalist, and a handful of other overseers and superintendents. Who are the oppressed? The many, the nations of the earth, the valuable personages, the workers, they that make the bread that the soft-handed and an idle eat. Chapter 4 Section 4, Religion Twain was a Presbyterian. He was critical of organized religion and certain elements of Christianity through his later life. He wrote, for example, faith is believing what you know ain't so, and if Christ were here now there is one thing he would not be, a Christian. With anti-Catholic sentiment rampant in 19th century America, Twain noted he was educated to enmity toward everything that is Catholic. As an adult, he engaged in religious discussions and attended services, his theology developing as he wrestled with the deaths of loved ones and with his own mortality. Twain generally avoided publishing his most controversial opinions on religion in his lifetime, and they are known from essays and stories that were published later. In the essay Three Statements of the Eighties in the 1880s, Twain stated that he believed in an almighty God, but not in any messages, revelations, holy scriptures such as the Bible, providence, or retribution in the afterlife. He did state that the goodness, the justice, and the mercy of God are manifested in his works, but also that the universe is governed by strict and immutable laws, which determine small matters, such as who dies in a pestilence. At other times, he wrote or spoke in ways that contradicted a strict deist view, for example, plainly professing a belief in providence. In some later writings in the 1890s, he was less optimistic about the goodness of God, observing that if our Maker is all-powerful for good or evil, he is not in his right mind. At other times, he conjectured sardonically that perhaps God had created the world with all its tortures for some purpose of his own, but was otherwise indifferent to humanity, which was too petty and insignificant to deserve his attention anyway. In 1901, Twain criticized the actions of the missionary Dr. William Scott Ament because Ament and other missionaries had collected indemnities from Chinese subjects in the aftermath of the Boxer Uprising of 1900. Twain's response to hearing of Ament's methods was published in the North American Review in February 1901, to the person sitting in darkness, and deals with examples of imperialism in China, South Africa, 
and with the U.S. occupation of the Philippines. A subsequent article, to my missionary critics published in the North American Review in April 1901, unapologetically continues his attack, but with the focus shifted from Ament to his missionary superiors, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. After his death, Twain's family suppressed some of his work that was especially irreverent toward conventional religion, including Letters from the Earth, which was not published until his daughter Clara reversed her position in 1962 in response to Soviet propaganda about the withholding. The anti-religious The Mysterious Stranger was published in 1916. Little Bessie, a story ridiculing Christianity, was first published in the 1972 collection Mark Twain's Fables of Man. He raised money to build a Presbyterian church in Nevada in 1864. Twain created a reverent portrayal of Joan of Arc, a subject over which he had obsessed for forty years, studied for a dozen years, and spent two years writing about. In 1900 and again in 1908, he stated, I like Joan of Arc best of all my books, it is the best. Those who knew Twain well late in life recount that he dwelt on the subject of the afterlife, his daughter Clara saying, sometimes he believed death ended everything, but most of the time he felt sure of a life beyond. Twain's frankest views on religion appeared in his final work autobiography of Mark Twain, the publication of which started in November 2010, 100 years after his death. In it, he said there is one notable thing about our Christianity, bad, bloody, merciless, money-grabbing, and predatory as it is, in our country particularly and in all other Christian countries in a somewhat modified degree, it is still a hundred times better than the Christianity of the Bible, with its prodigious crime, the invention of hell. Measured by our Christianity of today, bad as it is, hypocritical as it is, empty and hollow as it is, neither the deity nor his son is a Christian, nor qualified for that moderately high place. Ours is a terrible religion. The fleets of the world could swim in spacious comfort in the innocent blood it has spilled. Twain was a Freemason. He belonged to Polar Star Lodge No. 79 A.F. and A.M., based in St. Louis. He was initiated and entered apprentice on May 22, 1861, passed to the degree of Fellow Craft on June 12 and raised to the degree of Master Mason on July 10. Twain visited Salt Lake City for two days and met their members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They also gave him a Book of Mormon. He later wrote in Roughing It about that book the book seems to be merely a prosy detail of imaginary history, with the Old Testament for a model, followed by a tedious plagiarism of the New Testament. Chapter 4 Section 5, Vivisection Twain was opposed to the vivisection practices of his day. His objection was not on a scientific basis but rather an ethical one. He specifically cited the pain caused to the animal as his basis of his opposition. I am not interested to know whether vivisection produces results that are profitable to the human race or doesn't, the pains which it inflicts upon unconsenting animals is the basis of my enmity towards it, and it is to me sufficient justification of the enmity without looking further. Chapter 4, Pen Names Twain used different pen names before deciding on Mark Twain. He signed humorous and imaginative sketches as Josh until 1863. Additionally, he used the pen name Thomas Jefferson Snodgrass for a series of humorous letters. He maintained that his primary pen name came from his years working on Mississippi River boats, where two fathoms, a depth indicating water safe for the passage of boat, was a measure on the sounding line. Twain is an archaic term for two, as in the veil of the temple was rent in Twain. The river boatman's cry was Mark Twain or, more fully, by the Mark Twain, meaning according to the mark, too, that is, the water is twelve feet deep and it is safe to pass. Twain said that his famous pen name was not entirely his invention. In Life on the Mississippi, he wrote. Captain Isaiah Sellers was not of literary turn or capacity, but he used to jot down brief paragraphs of plain practical information about the river, and sign them Mark Twain, and give them to the New Orleans Picayune. They related to the stage and condition of the river, and were accurate and valuable, 
At the time that the telegraph brought the news of his death, I was on the Pacific coast. I was a fresh new journalist, and needed a nom de guerre, so I confiscated the ancient mariner's discarded one, and have done my best to make it remain what it was in his hands, a sign and symbol and warrant that whatever is found in its company may be gambled on as being the petrified truth, how I have succeeded, it would not be modest in me to say. Twain's story about his pen name has been questioned by some with the suggestion that Mark Twain refers to a running bar tab that Twain would regularly incur while drinking at John Piper's saloon in Virginia City, Nevada. Samuel Clemens himself responded to this suggestion by saying, Mark Twain was the nom de plume of one Captain Isaiah Sellers, who used to write river news over it for the New Orleans Picayune. He died in 1863 and as he could no longer need that signature, I laid violent hands upon it without asking permission of the proprietor's remains. That is the history of the nom de plume I bear. In his autobiography, Twain writes further of Captain Seller's use of Mark Twain, I was a cub pilot on the Mississippi River then, and one day I wrote a rude and crude satire which was leveled at Captain Isaiah Sellers, the oldest steamboat pilot on the Mississippi River, and the most respected, esteemed, and revered. For many years he had occasionally written brief paragraphs concerning the river and the changes which it had undergone under his observation during fifty years, and had signed these paragraphs Mark Twain and published them in the St. Louis and New Orleans journals. In my satire I made rude game of his reminiscences. It was a shabby poor performance, but I didn't know it, and the pilots didn't know it. The pilots thought it was brilliant. They were jealous of sellers, because when the grey heads among them pleased their vanity by detailing in the hearing of the younger craftsmen marvels which they had seen in the long ago on the river, Sellers was always likely to step in at the psychological moment and snuff them out with wonders of his own which made their small marvels look pale and sick. However, I have told all about this in old times on the Mississippi. The pilots handed my extravagant satire to a river reporter, and it was published in the New Orleans True Delta. That poor old Captain Sellers was deeply wounded. He had never been held up to ridicule before, he was sensitive, and he never got over the hurt which I had wantonly and stupidly inflicted upon his dignity. I was proud of my performance for a while, and considered it quite wonderful, but I have changed my opinion of it long ago. Sellers never published another paragraph nor ever used his nom de guerre again. Chapter 5 Legacy and Depictions. Chapter 6, Section 1, Trademark White Suit. While Twain is often depicted wearing a white suit, modern representations suggesting that he wore them throughout his life are unfounded. Evidence suggests that Twain began wearing white suits on the lecture circuit, after the death of his wife Olivia in 1904. However, there is also evidence showing him wearing a white suit before 1904. In 1882, he sent a photograph of himself in a white suit to 18-year-old Edward W. Bock, later publisher of the Ladies' Home Journal, with a handwritten dated note. The white suit did eventually become his trademark, as illustrated in anecdotes about this eccentricity. McMaster's The Mark Twain Encyclopedia states that Twain did not wear a white suit in his last three years, except at one banquet speech. In his autobiography, Twain writes of his early experiments with wearing white out of season. Next after fine colors, I like plain white. One of my sorrows, when the summer ends, is that I must put off my cheery and comfortable white clothes and enter for the winter into the depressing captivity of the shapeless and degrading black ones. It is mid-October now, and the weather is growing cold up here in the New Hampshire hills, but it will not succeed in freezing me out of these white garments, for here the neighbors are few, and it is only of crowds that I am afraid. Chapter 6, Section 2, Online Editions Works by Mark Twain at Project Gutenberg. Works by Mark Twain at Standard eBooks. Works by Mark Twain at Faded Page. Works by or about Mark Twain at Internet Archive. Works by or about Samuel Langhorn Clemens at Internet Archive. Works by Mark Twain at Libri. Vox. 
Chapter 6, Section 3, Libraries The Mark Twain Papers and Project of the Bancroft Library, University of California Berkeley Archive of Mark Twain's Papers and Writings Mark Twain Room at Buffalo and Erie County Public Library Samuel Langhorne Clemens Collection of Papers at New York Public Library Mark Twain Original Manuscripts from 1862 to 1909 Shapel Manuscript Foundation Mark Twain's Mississippi at Northern Illinois University Libraries Finding Aid to the Mark Twain Papers at Columbia University Rare Book and Manuscript Library Samuel Langhorne Clemens Collection Yale Collection of American Literature, Beinecke Rare Book, and Manuscript Library